Hello, and welcome to History After Hours. We are at Collective Coffee, and the date is May the 9th, 2019. And hopefully, we'll have some students ask us some questions to keep some topics going. But with us today is Dr. Christopher Thrasher. Hey Mr. Keith Todd, hey you're not a doctor yet, are you, Keith? No, no, no. Just we can master. call you that if you'd like. <laughs> I mean, master Todd is fine. Okay, Ma- master, master Todd, Todd is fine. <laughs> Ma- doctor. Then, Mr. Franklin. Hello. Yes. So, um, who's got some questions for us for our topics? They can be current stuff. It can be old history stuff. Favorite sports team. Favorite type of donut. Doesn't matter to me. <laughs> yes, we have someone. Oh, well, hello. As educators, what would you say your biggest weaknesses and strengths are? Sounds like we're getting interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> My biggest weakness is I work too hard. <laughs> I care too much. And uh, yeah, that's what you do in an interview. If they tell you your bi- biggest weak- weakness, you turn it into a, a positive. Um, oh, go ahead. <laughs> well. <laughs> we don't have any weaknesses. Yeah. I was, I was trying How about to go strengths? <laughs> Uh, no, I'll, I'll go with a weakness. I'll go with a weakness. Half of what I teach, I really don't know anything about. Um, so I got hired in at this community college to, you know, teach all the, they're, you know, teach all the histories, teach everything from the dawn of humanity to things that happened last week. Well, all of my coursework is 19th and 20th century U.S., so I'm trying to teach Periclean democracy, which, I mean, I've heard those words before. Um, and I think I may have kind of put it together a little over the years, but uh, the, the difference in how I teach early world history, which I really am, am not trained in, and versus something like you know teaching the Civil War era, which is something I actually have a lot of coursework in and actually have studied and I actually know what I'm talking about. I'd be real curious if, if students could tell the difference. Like it'd be really interesting to have a student that had like the first half of world history with me mm-hmm. and then the you know U.S. history course, could they tell the difference? Yeah. Or does it all just sound utterly incomprehensible <laughs> and make no difference? <laughs> I don't know. So yeah, that's my biggest weakness. I teach stuff I don't really know anything about. That sounds like my first five years of teaching. It's yeah. just, I didn't know anything. I was one day ahead of the students, reading yeah. the book. Um, I, I think one of my weaknesses is trying to cram too much into one day <laughs> and one year. I mean, I, honest to God, I try to teach everything I can possibly think of. And I think, it, I, think I can overwhelm students at times with the, amount, the volume of information that I try to throw at them. Um, mm-hmm. But it, it just seems so urgent to me to try to make it mm-hmm. relevant. For instance, uh, our, our standards basically say that we should start world history at Renaissance which seems ridiculous because the world history didn't start then. So um, I try to back up and tell the entire story, um, partly because I want students to be able to see that even the ancient stories, or it's, it's that cause and effect, it, it rolls through one thing to the next, and it's, you know, it, it's this dynamic thing that ultimately leads to them. So I'm, I'm pushing hard to try to get where I'm going. I, I think I need to do a better job of trying to trying to figure out what, what could I actually cut from some of those earlier stories and still make it relevant. I struggle with letting things go. Right. I, I mean, I think that's still one of mine, too, is trying to figure out where the right amount of depth is versus breadth, you know, and m- trying to make those decisions. But time management is really one, too. Nobody tells you in your education classes that you're going to be turning in 18-hour days for your first five years of teaching <laughs> while you're trying to get it all figured out. And so by the time you get to this point of the year, you're just exhausted you know isn't it funny the people who don't teach and they go you've got it so easy your schedule is so yeah, like, yeah. you don't know the hours we put in that we're not paid for sir uh, my biggest weakness um, is reaching students that aren't proactive mm. the students that are proactive I'm good with if they come to me but if a student wants to hide in the corner I won't pressure them very much um, I don't know I don't and maybe it's I'm fear of embarrassing them fear of you know calling them out and whatever um i I probably if i would do a a lot better job if i would be better one-on-one with students that don't care as much i'm great with the students that care but it's the students that don't care how to turn that switch on to make them care every now and then i will be better than the the wording you just used there like make them care i i I really don't think that that's possible you can't we've had this conversation before i think you can't make students learn I, I, I can encourage you as much as I possibly can. That's but what, I've but never, that's but I, can't, what I don't do. I, I don't encourage them enough. I, I can't don't. make you do it. If you just if no. you choose to exit mentally, you know, I, I don't know how to 
I don't know how to, I mean, I can redirect. I know how to do those things. But at the same time, if you just, if you're determined not to learn something, that's the way that's going to work out. If you if you won't do any extensions, if you won't think about it past what I'm doing right in front of you, like I, there's, I can't follow you home and drill this into your head. Either you want to or you don't want to. And, and I think it, it, it's interesting because I've heard administrators in, in conferences and things and they say, you have to make students learn. And I just kind of laughed at myself. I just, I don't know how you make people do things they don't want to do. I, again, I, I can encourage you all day long, and I'll, I'll set it up and make it as interesting as I can. But if you just choose ignorance, I don't know what to do. Maybe that's a weakness of mine. I, I don't know. Well, my weakness really is building those one-on-one. Like, you could be in my class all year long, and I, I might not interact with you very much, really, on a one-on-one. Now, obviously, I'm engaged with the classroom while I'm teaching, and I discussions and debates and, and all that. But you could probably hide in my class okay. And me, and that's what I need to get better at is con, not confrontation, but you know, being encouraging, be, you know, making a connection, being me being proactive instead of making you know them. But anyhow, we all have our cross to bear. Do you see that at National Park? I mean, do you do you have students who are who come in with, hey, I have to have this class, but I don't really want to engage? And like, do you guys have a certain approach to it? Yeah, I don't, I don't think we have nearly as much of it because if a student doesn't show up to our class, it's not a criminal offense <laughs> like it potentially <laughs> is for you guys. Yeah, right. Like you have people that are choosing your class over jail and maybe <laughs> making that choice somewhat reluctantly. Uh, I mean, no, nothing against y'all. Y'all are great teachers. But, I mean, there, there's a pressure there that you have uh, or they just have a, a pressure. And, and I taught high school, and that was the issue that I had was – I had people that just absolutely positively did not want to be there. If they had any choice in the world, if they could have, I think I probably had some students that if they could have gone to jail rather than go to school, they would have gone to jail. And the only reason they did not is because their parents would bail them out of jail and bring them back to school. Oh. And good for those parents doing yeah. that. But, um, yeah, so no, not, not really. All right. Does somebody else have another question? Wait, no, you didn't, you didn't say strengths. Oh, uh, well, None of everything did. else. <laughs> <laughs> I'm freaking awesome. So there you go. Well, it's, so, it's hard to talk about strengths, but I mean, <laughs> not, I, I'm, not I'm also, I'll brag on the other people in the room, and I haven't had the good fortune to have a class with Dr. Thrasher, but I hear about what a f- wonderful storyteller you are. I can tell me a story. I can spin a yarn, sir. <laughs> right. You'd be and a great grandpa. <laughs> oh, wait. Right, and that, <laughs> and how, Mr. Pumphrey, how you put your kids in charge of their learning. I hear constant praise for that, that they appreciate that so much more, that you are willing to trust them to learn. That's and hard to do. That's fantastic. When you're used to being the, the wise sage on stage and having control of everything, that took years for me to give that up and just, uh, just let them go do it. That's a hard, yeah, that took a while. <laughs> uh, but that's the student, you know, that's the students, you know, that's... Well, I'll brag, I'll brag on myself if nobody else wants to. Uh, I think my, my greatest strength uh, is probably that I realize how much I don't know and I realize how utterly boring most people find history. And so one of the things I do in class that I think is very unique um, is I go in every time I teach class for the first time and I introduce myself and I say, okay, guys, what do you want to do? What are you interested in? And whatever they're interested in, I mean, I don't have a set curriculum like high school folks do. So I can pretty much do anything I want within the broad confines of the course. So they tell me what they're interested in, and we end up covering weird, wild topics. I've covered everything from it. A lot of times things get dark. I don't know how I feel about that, but things get real dark. So I cover things like, you know, Satanism and torture and, uh, you know. It's history. All the yeah, fun stuff. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean yeah. well, I think it's a lot of stuff that they realize that I'm – I'm willing to do things that are really weird. Like I'll, I'll approach a topic that a lot of like high school folks, because you have a lot of constraints, mm. either can't or would feel uncomfortable. And I, I have no sense of shame or social awareness. So I'm just, I'm kind of willing to go for just about <laughs> anything. So yeah, I go in the first day and I said, what do you want to do? And they tell me and I come in the next day and we have a calendar and it's filled with, okay. And then on April 3rd, we're going to talk about Jonestown. Uh, so look forward to that <laughs> and we'll, we'll do that. I mean, and I just, I roll with it. So I think, I think that, r- I realize I realize how little I know, and I realize that I and, and that started with me not knowing anything. I went the first time I was going to teach class, and I said, "Yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't, I don't, I don't know what the right topics are, so I'm going to ask them." So I just always ask them. And I'll say this: I haven't seen uh, Mr. Todd teach either because we we're on we're several doors down, and we don't get a chance to see each other teach very often. But how long have you been teaching? Three years at the end of this one. Okay, you, you have you more can't tell. knowledge. Yeah than any new, new-ish teacher that I've ever met. 
No, at you any need school I've ever been at as far as like a, a new person, new teacher coming in, just the amount of knowledge you have. Plus, uh, the, uh, how you dress is better than any new teacher. <laughs> it makes me look, look at me, I look like a slob. He's got ties and everything else, but yeah. Yeah, no, I, I second that. Like you came in like gangbusters, man. Like I, I'm thoroughly impressed with how, how ready you were to go on day one. And, uh, and I would hate it to have interviewed around you when you came in and interviewed. I'd hate to have been a new teacher that had to follow when you, I'm sure you rattled off all your, you know, some of your knowledge. <laughs> that other teacher comes in there and like, I don't know anything. It's one got. thing to have a, a breadth of knowledge too, but it's the, another thing to be able to communicate that too. And I think that you do an excellent job with that as well. All right, next question. Say something else where we can brag on ourselves. So, with like this school shooting happening two days ago, how do y'all feel about the safety of your students, like in the event that a school shooting would happen? All right, well, let's talk about statistics really quickly since you brought that up. Yeah. Um, the the statistical likelihood that there's going to be an event at our school is extremely low, and I know that it seems if if we look at at the statistics around just let's say mass shootings in the country in general. Like we're, we're up to like 119, I think, since January, mass shootings, not in schools, but just across the nation. Um, and so you look at that and you go, oh my God, that's, this is, there's so many people. And then, and then there was a, a shooting at North Carolina, what is it, uh, UNC Charlotte. Mm -hmm. And then we had the one in Colorado uh, yesterday at, at one of the high schools at STEM school. And so you see these things on TV and you see them maybe often uh, and you think, ooh, it's, you know, we're in danger. There are millions of students who go to school every single day and nothing happens. And there's something for you to that you know take some solace in that. Do we need to be proactive and make sure that we are attentive and, and watching for the signals that may show that someone is is going down a dark path? Yeah, we definitely need to do that. But at the same time, I don't. The statistical probabilities are so low. I'm not gonna say they're negligible, but at the same time, they're at least should give you a peace of mind where you go. It's it's probably not today, and it's probably not here. More than likely, and so. You know, but and but in the, and just to finish that answer, we do uh, uh, shooter preparedness drills. I mean, we we go through that's one of our training uh, issues. So that should help you feel better too. Mm -hmm. right. And I think Lakeside does a good job uh, as far as what you can do to prevent something horrific from happening. We have a little more technology. We've got the wire bolts on the door, and you know, in case of a lockdown, a lot of schools don't have that. We got a full time resource officer r with a weapon. A lot of schools don't have that. So I think we're in a pretty good situation. I mean, now obviously something could still happen, but you can't live your life in fear, worrying about, I mean, we gotta teach at the end of the day. You just gotta, you can't control everything, so. Mm -hmm. So one of, the, one of the number one things that any school could try to do is to try to make and help students understand what a big part of it that they are, like uh, and how in charge of your own security you are. If we look statistically or and take those anecdotal stories from these kinds of events, it is always somebody who has been marginalized. It's always somebody who feels like they are on the fringe, that they don't have anybody, and that feel an intense sense of rejection. That's what the student body is in charge of. And so whenever you see somebody like that, take the time to sit down next to body, next to somebody and just ask them how their day was. Ask them their name. Make them not feel that way. Or if you see some sort of warning sign in somebody, or you, or someone's made a direct threat, or even an indirect threat, like the 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 story that just happened yesterday. There were students who came forward and said, "Well, he said some weird things before, but we thought he was joking." Like you, you have to take those things seriously, no matter who it is, and, and whether you think that might be in jest or not. Like those things have to be investigated, because now they wish they had said something, and mm -hmm. and. And multiple families do too. So there's, there's a, that's a sad part of the story that some kids knew there were warning signs and didn't follow through. Uh, because again, you guys see each other more than we do. For instance, I, what I see you guys 50 minutes every day. That's it. The rest of your day, I don't know what you do and where you go. And so you, you guys have a much better bead on the, on the pulse of the, of the tone and the feel of the school campus than anybody else would. So you've got to be proactive. And it's no coincidence that this has increased as technology has increased, as uh, mental health issues and prescription pills, and you know these are things that's really increased in the last 20 years. And um, studies have shown that the feeling of isolationism, and then of course you add cyberbullying to that, mm -hmm. and all that have went up steadily. And suicide rates, in fact, have went up steadily because of that. 
Um, so I think there's it's a multifaceted issue. Uh, and, I, and I agree with everything y'all said, but just to give you a, a college perspective on this as well, uh, I think one of the things that, that's really important y'all have kind of hinted at is, uh, but not said exactly, is uh, the mental health care piece of this. Mm -hmm. uh, and at, at National Park College, I think we have a great security team. We have sheriff deputies. We have a director of security, and that's great. And I'm glad we have that. Uh, but I think more importantly than that, although those guys are great, is the fact that we have a really fantastic counseling team. Uh, we have really good mental health resources, and I think we're all really good. We're, we're aware of, you know, things to be on the lookout for, and not even just, oh, no, you know, that person's going to do something dangerous, but just th this, this person's having a hard time. This person needs some help. This uh, person needs somebody to, you know, to, to chat with for a minute. Um, and so I think I, I, I put more faith in our, uh, our counseling team than our security people, as great as they are. seems like being in a college setting, it mm -hmm. would be, more difficult maybe to, to enforce a perimeter because you guys have an open campus where we don't. Correct. And I wonder, uh, do, yeah. what, what, do you guys have conversations about that or how do they? Yeah, do, I do mean, we, we definitely People have, patrol, I mean, is that what happens? We do. We do yeah. have uh, Garland County Sheriff's Department deputies that are on, constantly on campus and patrolling. Mm -hmm. So we have a full-time security guy uh, who's a retired cop. We have several criminal justice instructors that when they're not teaching, they're, you know, they're on the lookout for things. Uh, so, yeah, I think we, and we, I think we have a really good plan for how to deal with those issues and how to, you know, be alert to that. But you're right. I mean, we're in, in that sense, we're less like a high school and we're more like a, you know, uh, an office building or something like that. Places yeah. where people can come and go. But I mean, I, th hey, I think Jordan, we're pretty good. Can we come up here real quick? Can I ask you a question too? By the way, after this conversation, uh, have another question ready. <clears throat> Do this is just from uh, we know our perspective, but I'm curious since you brought that up, what your particular perspective is as a student on campus like do you generally feel safe I on a day well, come on, you say that into the thing so <laughs> <laughs> I mean as a student I feel safe at Lakeside but I'm just like curious how y'all feel about teachers and the safety of your students you know? how would you feel about teachers carrying weapons on campus Ooh. some teachers that are really like kind of sketchy so <laughs> <laughs> I just I don't he's, think he's, I'm any of them sitting right there I was going to any of them in this room to. or who you, you, why'd no. you look at me when you said no. that <laughs> none of y'all but just like um, some teachers <laughs> at our school aren't very I don't feel comfortable around them no. so. okay well that's a separate conversation maybe all right all right yeah, arming teachers is to carry weapons. We, they, we hope that's the rest of that sentence. Yeah. I mean, what, what about you guys? You think that? Um, I mean, I have a concealed carry permit. Would you? No. I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't feel comfortable carrying a weapon on campus. No. I'm I think not, it, I'm yeah, not I think trained in that idea. emergency situation. I wouldn't want to try to be a cop. I wouldn't want to be like when the real dudes show up. I don't want to be a guy with a gun that they go, "Hey, there's a guy with a gun." I mean, you, yeah. you know. I mean. We don't need uh, an 80 year old librarian to do barrel rows out in the hallway. <laughs> and start. You know, the first time a teacher accidentally shoots a student, you know, right. it's, could you imagine the backlash then? We've armed teachers and then all of a sudden there's an accidental shooting. Or, uh, you know, or can you imagine the crossfire? Keith's at one end of the, of the <laughs> hall, Nixon's at the other end. They both have weapons, and there's a crossfire now. Right. Yeah. And it's like, no telling who could get caught up in the middle of that. Right. Uh, what, a, what a concealed carry permit does for you versus what a live action situation, how you need to respond, the training that requires are two very different things. Mm, yeah. No, I'm, and I'm, I'm not shy about saying that, yeah, I have coworkers that I would not enjoy the idea of them being armed. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's not something that I you know, even want to think about. But b before we move on, I, I got to share one, one more story to try to just ram home this whole idea of like how powerful a kind action really is for somebody, especially if they're the ones that are feeling disaffected. When I first moved down to Hot Springs, um, before that, my wife was here and she was here for about nine months before I was able to move down. And I was doing a lot of driving back and forth. It was, you know a Monday morning at three o'clock in the morning and I'm on the road to get to work because I, you know, spent every moment that I could down here for that weekend. And I'm on my way out of town, middle of nowhere, I'm, I've left the city limits and there's a body on the shoulder. There's somebody laying there and I think to myself, oh God, somebody's been hit. I pull over, I call 911, the person gets up. And I think, oh good, <laughs> this person is alive. And then they start coming towards the truck. And now I'm like, uh, I'm no longer comfortable in this situation, right? Um, you should so be I'm, I'm talking to the guy and 911's still on the phone. I'm like, oh, wait, he just got up. Um, hold on, <laughs> right? Um, 
<laughs> and so the, the, the story that the guy tells me is that he had been at a party and apparently he got too crunk and his friends left him and he was trying to in walk the back in the ditch and he was trying to walk back to Mount Ida and I was like get in the truck like mm. this is not not safe and so I'm, I'm talking to the guy and I'm chatting in, to in the, the guy. cab or in the back in the cab oh, okay in the cab because it was winter um so I'm talking to the guy on the way back and I he says here you know turn here turn there get him to where he's going in Mount Ida and he he gets out of the truck and closes it and he says and he kind of knocks on the window, so I roll it down. And he says, man, i got to be honest with you. I was here tonight to, to hold somebody up and take their truck. But you were the first person in two years to treat me like a human being. And I have to tell you how much that meant to me. And he said goodbye. And I sat there and had a panic attack. <laughs> <laughs> but that was that moment. And there are a lot of people out there that would tell you that that was a dumb thing to do to offer that guy a ride. And yeah, I took a big, big risk. But that, that meant something to that guy. And that night, take, taking that kind of kind action saved my life based off the choices that I had made. And that's not necessarily a rare occurrence. Those kind of small, kind actions, they matter. And we all need to make it a point to try to do them more. Yeah. Good story. Yeah. Tell him to get some new friends. <laughs> okay, does someone else have a question or a topic we can ramble on about? All right. So, Mr. Franklin, I know in the next few days and next week you're going to be talking about how different our life was compared to yours. But I want to know how different our high school environment is compared to your high school environment. Oh, Lordy. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, well, the, okay, so the background on the question, we, we just started talking about 9-11, um, and we're going through the different security things, and I, uh, we talked about, you know, the day and what it was like for us to live through it, and then so the next, the follow-up is, you know, the, 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 the response that the, that the nation had, where we talk about the political response, and we'll talk about the uh, Patriot Act, and we'll talk about the uh, Homeland Security stuff, but, but we're also going to get into the the, the very real difference between, it's not just an age thing, mm -hmm. you know, I graduated high school in 87, and so that's, you know, 32 years ago now. So, uh, and, and I know that would make a difference in and of itself, but just the concept of, of, of freedoms that we had that you guys don't have. Okay, so if we set that aside for a moment and just think about, okay, what was high school like for us? Uh, I went to a fairly small high school. Actually, I, I moved here from Tulsa, which was a fairly large high school. And then we came in um, in 1985, and my mother uh, got a job at one of the smaller schools here and graduated with about 42 other people. So that was a big change, because there was like, I don't know, close to 1,000 in my class in Tulsa. Uh, so it was kind of a, that was a, that was a big shift for us. I remember the first day, I was sitting in the, in the um, gym, and the principal was gonna come out and address the whole student body, and I'm sitting there looking, and like one half of one side was filled. And I was like looking at the guy next to me. I'm like, bro, there's some buses later. What's going on? He was like, no, this is it, man. I'm like, oh, okay. So I realized it was going to be very different. So, I, I mean, it may be different at, at larger schools, but we, we weren't concerned about I, – I, I never gave a second thought to safety and security. Most of us carried pocket knives. There were people that hunted after school that had weapons in their vehicles. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did a gun rack in the back of the truck, gun displayed. You know, obviously open and not loaded, but at the same time, they were there. They were on campus and nobody blinked an eye. Um, dress code was much more lax. Um, they didn't care about the girls wearing, was it the spaghetti strap thing? They really have no shoulders. Like that, apparently that's <laughs> some sort of weird new academic, you know, standard that we can't share, wear shoulders. We wore tank tops and, and, you know, I'm a little redneck kid, so I've got like sleeveless shirts and, you know, um, I, but just the, the typical day, I mean, the, the academia, the academic part of it, you know, math, English, history, we had to do all those things. Uh, home ec, which you guys now call, you know, family consumer science, we had to go through those things. Uh, we had typing and coding. Our coding classes, I think I told you guys this, we actually punched in zeros and ones, man. Like we did actual binary code. We had this big page of, and we would punch, 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 zero, 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 one, 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 zero, one, one, zero, one, one. And if you got it right, then you had this little green blip on this green screen that did some little something and you felt like a great success, and you go on to be the first, you know, I guess with Bill Gates before Bill Gates. <laughs> um, didn't work out that way for me, so that's why I teach. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that we were, you know, when school was over, we just kind of ran around, did our thing, and I don't know that that's much different. You know, people socialize. 
Um, I think there's pros and cons, obviously. I think when you look back at, I don't know when everybody went to, but it's kind of like parenting. Back when we were kids, parents kind of gave you a little more freedom to mess up or to screw up. Schools did too. Uh, schools gave you a little more freedom to mess up or screw up. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, there wasn't as much accountability, which can be a bad thing. We didn't have all the state tests. And, you know, now you might have. You're quite a bit younger. But, mm -hmm. like, we Not didn't have school. any. All we had was the ACT. And it was kind of your boat to float. Um, and, but at the same time, I think racism was worse. People were less accepting of people mm -hmm. that were different. I think, um, you yeah, know, I, th I, think, I think I think it also depends on where you lived and went to school. But if people had some sort of um, what they would have called at that time, a, a, you know, you're what you said, like so you, you have a different sort of approach to life or whatever. Like, there wasn't a lot of acceptance. That's a that's a real that's a real difference between um, us and you guys. You guys are much more tolerant, open minded and and just kind of go with the flow where we would have been much more sort of self segregating, I think. You know, I know there's cliques and things like that, but we were we were much more sort of. I, don't, I think I there don't was more probably why, yeah. overall probably more real bullying, like yeah. real deal, like physical bullying. Yeah, but at the same time, fights. if you had a problem with somebody and somebody punched you in the nose, you kind of then you know shook it off and worked it yeah, out. Yeah, you didn't way. run to the. You know. Nobody I know ever you know got knifed or worried about somebody going to their car. Or, you know, coming back with a gun. We never worried about stuff like that, and I think that that's a different reality for you guys. Mm -hmm. The internet makes a big difference. You know, social media. You know. We, that 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 I think puts a different set of pressures on you guys. Than I know as a had. former administrator, the whole fighting thing with cell phones that is a huge. We don't you you know you fear a fight breaking out. Everybody's gonna pull out their phone, mm -hmm. and then it's on YouTube, and then your whole school is smeared because of it. So that, I know we really cracked down on. What that. year did you graduate high school? Ninety five. Ninety five. So internet. But was, when I was at internet was almost a thing. Hmm? Internet was almost a thing. Right. Well, no, it was not really. Not where I was at. Yeah. But yeah. like uh, at Bismarck, when I was an administrator there, that was a big shift when people started getting cell phones with cameras. You know, it's one thing to pull out a video camera. <laughs> you didn't have that in your pocket. But when cell phone, probably about 2009, 8, when, when cameras, video, recording equipment on your phone got better, that, that was a big shift for school administration. They had, okay, now we got to worry about pictures and and that's a different form of bullying that can go along with that too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i i went to high school in the early 2000s i graduated in 04 um and i kind of went to a podunk nowhere school too i think my graduating class was like 75 but i had the very good privilege of getting to grow into technology like as technology was really starting as far as personal technology was going it was all just coming on my very first cell phone was one of the blue Nokia bricks that you could hammer a nail into a board <laughs> with, you know, and it was fine. You know, there were no problems with it. And so we were, like, figuring all of this stuff out as it was coming on. Uh, when I joined Facebook, it was still only for a few select colleges that, you know, not everybody could just be a part of it. And it was – that was such a healthy thing, I think. But also, because we went to Podunk Nowhere, the coolest thing that we could do on a Friday night was to go to the football game – and then hang out in Walmart parking lot because there was literally nothing else to do. And that was so good for us because we complained about it, but we really got to know one another. And we had these really tight-knit and close friendships that, I don't know, maybe it still exists. Maybe it's, it's social media is making it happen in other ways, but I don't, I, I don't see what I had. And I'm, I feel sorry that it does, it's not there, and I don't know how to fix that. Like the face-to-face the -face camaraderie? Yeah. 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 Yeah, if you wanted to go out with a girl, you had to ask. You didn't, you didn't <laughs> like a photo, and then they, they poke you back, and then you, you know, all through the Internet to show that you kind of like somebody. You actually had to, you know, call or go what's up it, to them. What's it called on Instagram when you, it, you have this continuation thing? What's it called? Your, no, what's it called? DMs. What's that stand for? Direct message. Dur ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I graduated in 97. I had, I think, the most utterly bizarre high school experience uh, in an odd kind of conglomeration kind of way. So uh, I was uh, a very mischievous youngster. Uh, so at the ripe old age of 14, I got sent off to a Church of Christ high school uh, to save my soul. <laughs> Obviously, it didn't work. Uh, but then I realized one way to get out of this draconian place that I was trapped <laughs> in uh, 
uh, through nobody's fault but my own, uh, was that they had an agreement uh, with the local county schools. They had like a regional vocational center. Uh, and so I realized if I went and took, uh, you know, some kind of vocational something, I could get off that campus for half a day <laughs> after lunch. Um, and so I decided I would take anything. And the only thing they had open was welding. So I became a welder. And so I would get up every morning, go to school. I would go to chapel. I would take a Bible class. I would took a math and then an English class, which were absolutely nothing. Um, and I mean, there were... I mean, they were a private school. They should do whatever. They, I mean, this is rural Alabama, a private religious school. Like, they did whatever they felt like. They were, like, testing, like, was an alien concept. Like, is that, is that more what the rest of the schools in Alabama are like? Say what now? Is that what the rest of the schools in Alabama are like, too? Or are they all? Um, I don't know. I mean, I never. Public I never or private, one. I mean. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I never, I mean, I never attended one. Seems like they would tilt far right. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I mean, they. I mean, the school that I went to, it was, it was, I wouldn't even say it was far right. I mean, it's more like, you know, I used to joke that, you know, they, they have, uh, they have cars and stuff, but if, uh, you know, if the crops ever fail, they're going to burn a witch. Like, I think it's, <laughs> beyond, like, I think it's, you know, at some point that the left right spectrum breaks down. Like, this isn't even, like, these people weren't even right wing. Like, these people were like 19th century people that, you gave a cell phone to like it was a bad episode of bewitched or something like where somebody went back and you know found jedediah and you know goody glover and you know gave them chevrolets and you know watched the the madness ensue i mean that's basically who i was raised by and who educated me if you want to call it that sweet yeah so yeah half half a day of church of christ i mean which of church of christ that's great but like these were like extreme extreme there's levels to everything there's yeah. levels to everything and this was this I mean, was the level like this if, was, you, if you're burn the witch extreme that's pretty uh, i yeah. mean these these were people that would have like i mean i, I don't get too much into theology it doesn't matter i'll just i'll just say very very extreme very unique i respect anyone's religion as long as you don't actually burn a witch but um yeah they were so yeah and then i would go from that and i would have lunch and then i would you know, go hang out with these vocational kids that were just, you know, just redneck kids, probably very similar to what, what you, you guys there, Were you there the whole time? Like, did you graduate mm -hmm. there? Yeah, oh. yeah, I graduated from there. So I did four years of that, four years of Jesus and then welding, um, which yeah. is a odd experience. And I taught high school, <laughs> but I taught high school at a military college that had a high school attached, and I taught high school mostly for, uh, mo mostly foreign nationals. Um, the kids of very wealthy foreigners who wanted their kids educated in the U.S. So mm -hmm. I had the most bizarre high school experience you could have, and then I taught high school with the second most bizarre high school experience you could have. So, <laughs> yes, I attended high school, and yes, I taught sc high school, but not really. <laughs> but I really know nothing about real high schools. Yeah. That's you know, different. There was something else that was different about mine that I just kind of occurred to me. There was no such thing as pre-AP. Like there was just the class, like you were just, you were just in it. And that I think we only had two AP offerings total. Um, I'm not so sure that that was a bad thing for us. I, in a lot of ways, I think it was good. Something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about because I see it in our student body is the, the pre AP that is willing to try super hard and everybody else who's just kind of there and doesn't feel motivated. And I'm taking this class because I don't want to work. And I've I, actually heard kids say that. And I've, yeah. yeah. And that's slightly unique to Lakeside as well. Is it? Yes. I mean, I've been at other schools where they've had AP, pre-AP. At Lakeside, there is just this standard that if you, you're going to take pre-AP or AP unless you, you're at the bottom of the barrel. And so I think early on kids get defeated and they think, oh, well, I'm in this jar. I'm in this drawer down yeah, here. I worry so I'm, about I'm that. never taking. And then some kids get convinced they have to take AP when they maybe shouldn't. And it does make teaching challenging, especially at those lower levels. Because, mm -hmm. you know, but I, I, you know, when I was, okay, so my high school was tiny, tiny, tiny. I had 25 in my entire grade, and we were the biggest class. <laughs> um, we didn't have any pre AP, AP. You had one science teacher in high school, mm -hmm. one math teacher, you know. But we consolidated, because this is when Mike Huckabee was governor and he was consolidating schools. So my senior year, I went to Sheridan, which graduated over 300. So I went to mm -hmm. two different planets yeah. of high school. This high school, the tiny one, we had a smoking bin. 
where with if you were 16 and up, you could go smoke and dip with the teachers. Yeah, we had that. That was weird. I mean, you know, <laughs> had one hallway, seventh through 12th grade, and, you know, that was it. And then, then all of a sudden, but I, once again, I was a sports jock. That's all I cared about. And then all of a sudden, we're at this basically college to me. Um, so it was a very, that was a very big transition, I remember, my senior year. Yeah. In, in our smoking area, sometimes you see teachers out there bumming smoke from the kids. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, it's different times. Okay, it was very different. Yeah. All right, does anybody else have a topic or question? Oh, oh, here we go. All right, we have someone else coming. We'll do some rapid-fire questions after this if y'all want. If y'all did not have to sleep, what would y'all do in your extra time? <laughs> that would be my X-Man ability. If I had, like somebody said, well, if you had an X-Man ability... I mean, look, you could heal, live forever, all that. But if you didn't have to sleep, if you never got tired, that, you know, that, that also extends your life by a third. But, mm-hmm. man, what a great – just think if you didn't get tired tonight. Like, how much more you could accomplish. You watch movies, you're just not tired. And then you go play the piano, just not tired. I can't even mm-hmm. imagine that. But our whole life is based around sleep. So, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm terrified by the thought because <laughs> we're already under so much intense pressure to work so much in, oh, yeah. in America. If sleep wasn't a requirement, I mean, I, just, Have a stroke I, I, can, see, I can see these 18-hour days constantly that that was, you know, you got enough kind of like you know, pre-industrial yeah, Russia. Yeah. You, you had enough time to go home and eat and and then have to come back to the factory. That's I would a, want that power by myself, though. I don't want everybody. Then, then I'm not special. <laughs> yeah. I want to have that, you know, I can get ahead. <laughs> Don't you think that's a, a very um, uh, industrialized American kind of question? What if we don't have to sleep? <laughs> like I, other countries look at us in the work patterns that we have, and they think that it's ridiculous. I, I was, I was yeah. speaking with a, one of our parents, um, this is several years ago, and he works here in the United States, but he also they have offices over in Spain. And he would go there, and, and they're ready to have the meetings and stuff. And he was actually complaining. He goes, they, in the middle of the day, they just stop. And they take these, you know, we, we, it's gonna, we're going to have lunch. But then you're not really sure when everybody's coming back from lunch. And he's, I'm ready to work. And everybody's wasting their time. And they're looking at him like, he's crazy. Like, dude, slow down. We're going to get there. And we're just sort of, the, these, we're driven to like, go, go, go until we, you know, have a heart attack and then die. At, mm-hmm. you know, Isn't that built in to... Isn't that is what 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 is it about us that makes us the that crazy way, people that had to that decided to come over here to begin the puritanical with? sort of we must work or God hates us kind of thing? Just imagine if you're you know a poor Polish person or somebody from Germany or Ireland to take that three thousand mile journey in the seventeen hundreds or whatever you had to be a little crazy. Don't you think it has to be some of that though? Because when you think about the Portuguese or the Spanish controlled territories, like the ones that are now their own countries, like they don't have that same sort of. Mm, you know, it's that weird yeah. sort of Northern European thing, I, I think. I right. think so. I don't well, know. I mean, there are places around the world that have got similar stories, though. I mean, we've got Canada to the north. We've got Australia, largely populated by this, the same initial immigrants. Not the, not, the, not the Puritan people, though, right? But well, that's such an isolated group at the time. Well, I just yeah. wonder where it's coming from. I, yeah, you're right, but I wonder like, how it became so prevalent because it is a thing. I mean, it's a, it's a stereotype for us. I mean, maybe it's the Puritan... Combined with our republic that we founded and the capitalist, where you could go west and if you work hard enough, you could have a log cabin which nobody in Europe could ever dream of. And maybe that's maybe it starts that like far you, back. The pioneering, you have to work or you die kind of thing. I mean, I don't know. We teach little kids that from the very beginning, that the whole John Smith story either you work or you don't eat. I mean, that kind of yeah. thing. Right. I don't know. But that's all pre industrial, too. Yeah. Like, you know, that when we get that hit that industrial revolution and the transition from the farm to the factory, that's really when the, the shift that we're still carrying through is, isn't it? Yeah, that's probably a lot of it. And so, like, how, how labor changes, you know, like, Selling there's, that, there's that big 1880s, 1870s, like, agricultural wheel movement that falls on its face in the United States. I don't think that falls on its face in a lot of other European places. Yeah. What would you, all right, so answer the question, what would you do if you didn't have to sleep, though? I would I would learn like every language. Mm. That would be fun. Would you? Not every language. There's like what six thousand. That's, that's a lot of them. Um, yeah, I'd learn several. Yeah. With the extra time, maybe. Yeah, La- language, music, and and that that family time that I sacrifice now for the sake of work. If everybody else doesn't sleep too. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, you have to wake yeah. up. Otherwise, you're just looming over them, and that's well, that's true. <laughs> I mean. You got to stay up with me. 
<laughs> I need some sleep. Uh, but yeah, I've wanted to learn ASL, American Sign Language, for five years now. Oh, that's a good one. I don't know. We had the. We were saying that we would learn. We would do all these great. I don't know that we would. <laughs> I don't. I mean, we've got free time now. Oh, it's wow. not like we're going. I'm gonna to, play some video games. I'm like, it's, gonna, it's happening. I'm thinking about being a musician and finishing playing wherever at 2 a.m. and not having to sleep. Yeah, that'd be great. I just go home and chill. You know. So I don't know. I probably would do something. I guess. All right. The let's go the opposite direction with that. Denver just decriminalized magic mushrooms, which kind of take you off on this little trip where you can be more relaxed, right? So what do you think about that? I don't know. I've never done magic <laughs> mushrooms. No, I guess he hasn't either. What, what are you looking at me for? <laughs> <laughs> well, if the shoe fits. I'm catching a vibe. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, uh, you know, I, I mean, is, are we really going to do psychedelics now? And that's going to be... Well, decriminalizing is I don't mean we, like the four of us. I just mean as a country. Mm. Yeah, I mean, decriminalizing mushrooms or weed or whatever... Well, that's, okay. Let me clarify. They, they said that it's not. It's technically still illegal, but they're not going to the co the uh, police right. are not going to prioritize it. Right. Right. So right. Right. If you're trafficking, they're I mean, still going to stop you. Yeah. Nonviolent offenders. I, I'm I'm fine with that. Well, you're not hurting somebody else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know that. I think the jury's still out on all of this. I think it's too new. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how many studies have been on marijuana use in Colorado or some of these places where it's been legal. It's going to be interesting to see. Is it more widespread? I'm sure the use of it. It's probably a little more widespread. It's interesting to know, is it going younger? Are more kids using when they really shouldn't be because their frontal lobe's not developed? Um, you know, is it causing more violence or fatalities, or is it helping? Obviously, marijuana's been the to also Part help. of the argument Things. for it was that for people in particular who were dealing with PTSD or some type of serious... Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. um, Cancer... Yeah, yeah right. Like so they, it could it could help give them a better quality of life as as they're dealing with some hardcore issue, and it, it may be an end of life sort of thing that they're dealing with too. But it could be something. It like does seem the war on drugs failed miserably. Mm -hmm. um, for most, you know, I mean, we talk about freedom in America. We're the freest country. No, we incarcerate most of our people. Uh, That's where that comes from too, by the way. Mm -hmm. That whole war on drugs, because mm -hmm. if you criminalize and, and make it a uh, you know maximum sentencing for small amounts of like there are a lot of people in prison for, for I mean, they're nothing. doing some serious time. Yeah. where we kind of shrug at it now and go, good God! But then you, that coincided with the privatization of of uh, prisons in this country too, which mm -hmm. is this. Yeah. I know, yeah. No, you don't think so. Money. All right, well, correct me then, because that's what I thought was right. No, I, I mean, even even now, private prisons are a, a small minority of prisons. I, I think that is it? Is, okay. They are. I, I mean, I, misinformed I, I think then. that, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, I, it's, it, that's possible because I, <laughs> in, improvisation is something that doesn't come along a, a little bit later. I think that's more of a Reagan and a Bush kind of a kind of era, whereas we're talking war on drugs, we're really talking Nixon, 68, 69. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, um, well, I was, I was thinking more Reagan era, actually, with the, yeah. Just say, you know, just say no and all that. Well, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, Reagan definitely was a big. Uh, Isn't that when they yeah. when they put the the hardcore sentencing on though? I mean, some of it, but I mean, you you get into like sixty eight, sixty nine. That's really when the war okay. on drugs starts. That's when okay. Nixon is saying we're yeah. going to go after, and you get into. I mean, it depends on how much you want to buy into the stuff from like Lee Atwater. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Lee Atwater, big Republican strategist, who argued that. Uh, Nixon saw an opening. Uh, he saw the George Wallace campaign as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, I can't go over after things. Once again, this is all, you know, very controversial historiography, so take it with a grain of salt. But Lee Atwater, who was a, a Republican strategist, he argued that, well, uh, Nixon and some of those other um, folks realized, hey, George Wallace is getting votes. We can't be overtly racist because if we do that, if we, you know, if we go George Wallace, then we're going to turn people off. So we need to find a way of kind of getting some people, some of those people oh. who like Wallace to kind of vote for us. Dog whistle it in. Dog whistle it in. And huh. then the people who, who you know, do not like racism can still kind of feel good about, about is voting for it. 68 or 72? Uh, well, 68 to start with. 68 is, mm -hmm. I think his initial, Nixon's like initial announcements were in 68. Mm -hmm. um, 60, 68, 69 is when he started kind of making this an issue. Um, and so when you start saying things like war on drugs, when you start saying things like, you know, I'm going to uh, oppose the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which I think there's legitimate philosophical reasons to, to not love the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I mean, I support it, but I, I, ca I, can, I can see a libertarian kind of counter argument. You start seeing these types of things, um, it's, I mean, that's the whole Southern strategy. I mean, you can read stuff like Flam's Law and Order. You can read yeah. Politics of Rage, Dan Carter, stuff like this. Mm -hmm. would take, like I said, it's, it's controversial. A lot of people would say that that's not what's really going on, but that's, 
if, if you're trying to explain the war on drugs, I would I would investigate that historiography. Okay. Yeah. There's a big push during H.W. Bush's campaign, too, um, because the the crack academic that mm-hmm. everybody is super concerned with with crack and it, George H.W. Bush holds up a bag of crack and <laughs> and like and this can be instantly addictive and, and all of these things and <laughs> is 100 percent aware that some of these things that he's saying are lies but is saying them anyway for the sake of the votes and for to look tough on crime and those kinds of so things. So I'm, I'm the law and order candidate? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And so I yeah. think there's a, a long history of that from Nixon forward, too, trying to look like you're tough on crime. Did he, did he take that baggie away from Dan Quayle? <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, I think that's really kind of problematic because we are starting to see things like certain chemicals inside of like magic mushrooms that people who have got like hardcore clinical depression a couple of experiments with them and the depression seems to go away and these are tests that have been done in a clinical setting more recently that for 60 70 years those tests weren't even allowed to be performed by the scientists so i think there could be some real medical benefits here the uh, that we're opening it up to self-medication though is probably not the best idea yeah yeah well you know, I, and i didn't read i don't know if that's going to be a controlled thing or they're letting yeah. people have a personal use you know, caveat, I don't mm-hmm. know. Okay, I'm going to ask a few rapid-fire questions. Okay. And um, this is, of course, we're wrapping up our History After Hours podcast for the school year 2018-2019. So for those of you who have listened, thank you very much. Thank you, Collective Coffee, for having us out here Ooh. once a month. We appreciate that. Uh, but I'm going to ask you some questions. Try to keep your answers, you know, reasonably where I can ask you more questions. We'll do this just a few of them. We'll see, see how this goes. All right, here's first question. You could answer in any order. If you had one piece of advice for a person who wants to succeed in your field, and we're all, we all have similar fields, but what would that be? One piece of advice for someone that wants to get in to do what you are doing. I would say don't get in it for the wrong reasons. I mean, you the endeavor to persevere. That's, that's the idea. If you... If you if you think that education is going to be this, you know, field trip and, and oh, we get all this time off and all these, you know, it, there are benefits to doing what we do. And, and, and the, the more the quality family time is definitely part of it. But I, I know people who have gotten into it because they think it's going to be an easy field to get to, uh, you know, mm-hmm. to pursue. It's not. If you do it, if you do this the right way, this is challenging every single day. Mm-hmm. Okay. Get ready to feel powerless that you were going to have hear of troubles and, and be, get brought troubles and you can't be everybody's hero. They're, you're not going to be able to fix every problem that you ever see happen in your building or in your classroom. And sometimes that's hard. So the college look, uh, perspective is a little different. Uh, I would say if you want to go, if you want to be successful in you know, college level history teaching, uh, find a niche um, because there are, like when I interviewed for my job, I think there were 80 some historians. Uh, and so you start looking, you know, and, and the search committee starts looking for, okay, what, you know, you love history and you have good grades, who cares? Uh, you know, what really makes you special? And I had some things that, that kind of made me unique. I had a, a public history connection. I had, um, I had a really good teaching demonstration. I had kind of some unique pedagogical things I was doing. So, so find a kind of a neat niche that will make you stand out. Yeah. Okay, question two. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Where's your answer? Oh. <laughs> my answer would be well I, I think what's very important okay if you've decided I mean I, I kind of echo all of that if you if you w- know that's what you want to do and you get into it I think it's important to have a good mentor but at the same time tr- kind of like w- find your style yeah. you know me and Franklin teach right beside each other we have very similar views on a lot of things but we don't teach anything a lot because nope. I can't do what he does and he and once you realize that and you make it your own the students will recognize that, that you're doing your thing. Yeah. You know, you're not trying to just go through the motions and all that. And, you know, it's just like doing anything. You, you copy the best teachers you can think of. You copy your mentor. But eventually you've got to find your own style of teaching. Yeah, good. Okay. Uh, here's a loaded question, but you don't have to get too personal. Hmm. What, if anything, do you wish you would have done differently in your 20s? I had the opportunity to travel abroad, study abroad, and I didn't do it because I was afraid of the debt. And I wish I'd have done it. Hear that, students? We're going to Spain and Portugal next year. You should sign up. <laughs> um, it, that's, that's tricky because my 20s were a, 
a, a, a decade of redemption for me because I was such an idiot in high school. Um, mm -hmm. But the one thing I regret not following through on is what you guys do so well, which is playing music. I, I love music. I live and breathe it outside of the classroom. I mean, I actually bring it into the classroom every single day, but I don't, I, I, can, I can play at things, but I don't, I've never followed through. And that's always been a disappointment of mine. My favorite memories are the memories of the stupid things I did. <laughs> and somehow, even though I have done unspeakably idiotic, stupid things, I refuse to regret them, and I refuse to feel ashamed because... Jesus School really fixed you, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I regret nothing. I regret absolutely nothing. And, I mean, there's lots of things. I don't know. It always reminds me of the Hunter S. Thompson quote. He said, uh, you know, I hate to recommend uh, drugs, firearms, and insanity to anyone, but they've always worked really well for me. Uh, <laughs> so it goes back to the find your niche thing. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of your, I mean, you know, I've done lots of things that... I definitely would not encourage anybody to do. I mean, there's lots of things I can see some 20-year-old kid about doing something and say, yeah, it's, it's, you know, odds are that's going to go badly. Uh, but I would have to confess at the same time I did something really stupid and it worked out well and I have a life that I'm very happy with and I have lots of fantastic memories to look back on and lots of crazy things I somehow survived. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I have no regrets. Uh, I mean, I don't have any major regret. I wish I would have spent more time getting prepared to teach, more time getting better at guitar. You know, I kind of was lazy, but I had fun in my 20s. I was single. I didn't have any kids. That's the time to do it. I had a great time in my 20s. I don't regret it, really. So I'm, I might have quit coaching earlier than I did when I realized I, that's not what I wanted to do, but I suffered for another couple of years. Um, I probably wish I'd have got out of that quicker, but, you know, you live and you learn. Um, all right, next. What one mystery would you like to have answer, an answer to? You can pick one. Just what? Uh, you mean like clarifying conspiracy theories and, or just anything? Any, yeah, yeah, any mystery that we're not quite sure about, something that's kind of lost mm. in history or maybe a problem scientists are working on and can't solve or whatever. Um, it... What's on the other side of the universe? I mean, once it ends, what's it, what are we expanding into? Right? I think that's, that would be an interesting thing. Could, could we ever get to the edge and report back? I don't know. Oh. Much more mundane, but I, I've heard all my life about the secret Vatican archives. Uh -huh. uh, what's in there? I want to know. I'd be curious to know what happened at Roanoke. I think that would be a good, good story. Yep. Um, yeah, creation of the universe type thing for me. What happened the millisecond before things were created? That would probably teach us a lot, you know, about mm, how all this thing got rolling or, I mean, obviously, man, aliens, all that stuff. But, yeah, you know, some of those big science questions I would probably like an answer to. Don't you think, thinking about the aliens, don't you think that, that just posing that statement, like, Either you say we are alone in the universe or we are not alone in the universe. I think both of those statements are equally mind blowing. You know, if, if there's all of this, you know, dimensionality to the universe and yet we're the only living things, which is a possibility, isn't that staggering? Or, on the other hand, if there's lots of other life and we're just unaware of it, isn't that equally staggering? I mean, I don't know which one is. More, no. mm. I don't know which one trips me out more. I guess I need magic mushrooms to help me out. <laughs> <laughs> Are we a simulation? Yeah. All right, we'll do one more question. How about the, um, we've done this one before. Uh, let's do a different one, which will be one problem. You can pick one problem in the world right now, and you can solve it. What problem would you pick? Global warming. More of it or less of it? <laughs> <laughs> Get rid of the people. Uh, uh, oh, man. Do you, I said, do, you do, do you go micro or maybe, macro on this? I don't know. Maybe this is cheating, but I'll say human suffering. That's a, yeah. Uh, mm. I strenuously disagree. <laughs> we need to suffer <laughs> to grow. Strenuously? That's the thing. Yeah. Like, what is I'm, human I'm not suffering? sitting next to you anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
That does open up a question, though. Like, where does suffering start? And where does, you know, I guess, you know, we're talking about starvation and horrible things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, oh, I, you know, I've, I've got to probably think global warming. I think that's going to be more and more of an issue. But to make a different answer, how about equality of opportunity for everyone on the planet? Wow. Some system where everyone has an opportunity to succeed. Wow. Just I, to piggyback on all of those things, I think, you know, we're, we're fast approaching 8 billion people on the planet. What, we've, we've doubled the, the population. I, I thought it was earlier, but it, we've doubled the population since 1970. Have I, did I say that right? I, I think I just saw that. Anyway, it's, been, it's you know, since, since World War II, though, that the, that the population of the Earth has doubled. Like, this, how do you sustain an ever-increasing population, which goes along with the global warming because mm -hmm. it ties in with the industrialization, which goes into the food production, which goes into, you know, how, how, do you, how do you make a, how do you solve that? Do we need to curb the birth rate or do we need to find new ways to allocate resources? I don't know. Now, I was freaking out about the population problem about five years. Uh, when we first started this podcast, I brought it up every podcast. Yeah. We need a plague. You know, we need an <laughs> asteroid, something. we got to level this thing out. Because when Teddy Roosevelt was alive, there was about 1.5 billion people on the planet. Now there's 7.5 or close to 8. But the new research, because of the industrialization and the smaller family size, they think it's going to level off in the next couple billion. I don't know if that's true, but that's what smart people do. Have said. Where do smart if, people think the tipping point is? If you want to solve the uh, the population crisis, I think it's pretty straightforward <laughs> answer. <laughs> uh, teach girls to read. Women that are literate, women that are educated, have fewer children. So there's your solution. Just hmm. teach every young lady in the world to read, and you will have fewer children. Isn't some countries, though, uh, the more children is a s status symbol as well? Yeah. Like it's a cultural... For men or women, though, that goes back to your point, yeah. For, for men, typically. You know, yeah. we, were, we were competing with India and China post-World War II, and that's when everybody was like, what's going on here? Because, you know, the baby boom was coming on. We were, we were going, mm -hmm. but um, obviously birth control pill, and some of that changed a lot. Right. All right. I think yep. we solved some good problems. <laughs> you guys that came in, do you guys have questions that you want to bring up here? Nothing. Any questions? Okay, just curious. Nope. Yes. Oh, well, here comes one. No, you got to come up here. No, you have to come yeah. up here. We got one last question for the 2018-2019 season of History After Hours. Make it count. No pressure. I'm Eddie Apodaca, and if you think I don't answer the DPQ tomorrow, will I get a three on my AP exam? <laughs> if you don't, Try, to, I will hunt you down. <laughs> um, <laughs> then you better do really good on the multiple choice. And the short answer to some degree. And the last essay. No, you need to answer the document-based question. That's 25%. Try. Get uh, yes, but don't it, skip it. What look, if it's easy? What if you, you know it? Read the rubric. If you give a thesis and do some historical context, and you put in place some. That's two of the just, seven. Yeah, you got. Yeah, you. I mean, it's, if you'll just do those things, you can get like a, a at least a minuscule grade on the DBQ, which then will help you overall. Don't skip it. Yeah. So this is a unique episode because a lot of my students aren't here because they're they have a test tomorrow. Yeah. And so we haven't had as many, and I knew we wouldn't because mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, y'all go home and study and and then get a good night's sleep because I got a big AP exam tomorrow. Mm -hmm. If only they didn't have to sleep. It, see, <laughs> there it, comes, it all comes back around, see. That's right. and that's a problem I would like to solve. <laughs> <laughs> How can everybody make a five on the AP exam to make me look great? All right. Well, that is the episode, and right. we will see you guys next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.